send you the mic so you can uh, raise your hands. You can raise your question for you. Yes, Chong. Okay, uh, I'm missionary Chong, uh, Chong Desop uh, from Tasmarinas Cavite. Uh, as we know, the Bangsa Moro organic laws has been signed, right? So, if so, the, uh, proclaim the gospel and evangelize there, it will be illegal, right? Am I right? So, PCEs, do you have any uh, plan or strategy to reach them, even though there's a, we will be closed that area? I want to know if you have any plan or strategy, if you share it, it will be help to us. This, the first executive director of the Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches more than uh, 45 years ago, uh, Florentino de Jesus, worked among the Muslims. And he said, Islam, I sincerely love all Muslims. And um, it was not hard then, but uh, you know, we see radicalization happening. Uh, in the last uh, uh, 20 years. Um, there has been an effort uh, uh, by the uh, Philippine Ecumenical Peace Platform, and also this is the uh, uh, CBCP, PCEC, NCCP, working together uh, to um, uh, initiate dialogue uh, among not only interfaith dialogue among uh, church leaders, but uh, Muslims and the military. So we have been working in the last more than 20 years. Um, personally, I visited Camp Darapanan. This is the headquarters of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. Anywhere, anytime uh, PCEC leaders would want to go there, we are always welcome. We have uh, help actually we have issued statements uh, supporting the BBL in the past, including the BOL. We know that hardships will come, but there are uh, inroads, there are initiatives by uh, uh, church leaders on how to work with the uh, MILF, MNLF, in fact, uh, the, la the late uh, Reverend Absalom Cerveza, uh, a uh, alliance pastor, was the spokesperson of the Moro National Liberation Front. And so the Kamakop, they have relationship with the MNLF. So there's no fear of uh, going to their places. Right now, uh, we do not know what lies ahead. But we believe that this is one effort of the church if... BBL or BOL would be one road to peace and having relationship with them. Then we supported it. But of course, when Sharia law comes and uh, when all this thing comes uh, five years, ten years from now, we do not know. But right now, what we have done is we have established relationships. We have many community development workers, peace workers, they know they are Christians from PCEC, NCCP, and they are there, and they are not being harmed. And they are doing all these ministries in the name of Jesus Christ. They're in Marawi, they're in Holo, they're in everywhere. So um, we're not afraid if that would come. The work of the Lord will still continue. But thank God we've had opportunities to have relationships with them. Even the Grand Mufti respects us, and we can go there anytime. There was one case in Marawi. Uh, there was a relief distribution in one of the madrasa. And then this pastor, Alliance pastor, inserted Bible. Okay, maybe you've heard that uh, in the news. And the uh, Muslim leader said, that is inappropriate. That is taking advantage of the hunger of the uh, Muslim people. They said, the Bible is not bad. It's okay to distribute that, but not in a relief bag. 
Okay? So we have to explain. We have to go to the, uh, the headquarters of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. And they said, oh, we're not uh, uh, angry because uh, he distributed Bible. But we are saying this is inappropriate because it was distributed when there's war and people are hungry and seeking for refuge. And he said, come back some other peaceful time. Distribute your Bible and we will help you distribute it. But of course, there's Quran also. <laughs> so thank God. Uh, we're not afraid. Come what may. Uh, whatever would happen in the future, we're not afraid, uh, brother. The work of the Lord would continue in Mindanao among the Muslims. And not only that, there are many Muslims that are believers of Jesus Christ right now who would help us. But more than that, the Lord is with us. Amen. Yeah, let, let me respond to that. That's why earlier I was saying in my presentation, uh, we have five years before 2022. We don't know what would happen you know, in the process because it was just approved and still a lot of rewriting and reworking would be done. But God is giving us five years. Let's do what we can. Let's partner together if needed to equip more Muslims. Win more Muslims, equip more Muslims so that when the time comes, the Muslims themselves will reach their own people. I'm glad Bishop Noel already has started on this. And that's the beautiful thing. If we are experts in underground evangelism, loving Muslims and serving them, even if Sharia law comes, we are not afraid. In fact, we rejoice because that's exactly how the gospel exploded in China. Thank God for Mao Tse Tung. Thank God for communism. Why? It took away the Western face of Christianity in China. Mao Tse Tung closed down the church buildings. Mao Tse Tung, he closed down the worship services. Mao Tse Tung closed down the Bible schools. Mao Tse Tung, what did he do? He drive away all the foreign missionaries. And number five, Mao Tse Tung put the pastors inside the prison. So, the ordinary believers, one million of them, became 100 million in 20 years. So that it is every believer sharing the gospel rather than just depending on the moksanim. We need to mobilize the whole church to share Jesus and to start house churches wherever they are. Office churches, Starbucks churches, uh, campus, college churches. That's the kind of multiplication. That's why church planting is good, but church planting movements, church multiplication is better. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Uh, actually, I'm also one of the members of the, we have a Philippine Christian school network. We have more than 20 above our group. We have a preschool to up to college, Bible school, and then the training, some course. This morning I heard about the message, even my personal self and then our pastor also. We have a Christian school. So we, are, we have two, in my case, we have two annex, we have one main. Total our students, more than 670 students. Wow. Uh, especially in resettlement center, peanut to a victim people area in Pampanga. So during we hearing and how to we our, we try our, my best event, our pastors involving together. With this year, more detailedly, we call campus ministry and the Bible time inserting the Christian the, uh, education. But uh, maybe some need of your some 
help and then giving some encouragement how to more detailly we make a way to possible for expansion the Filipino we raise up for expanding the God's kingdom and the mission. So that is the, our, all of the, our pastors, missionary heart. Still we are on the way and struggling. Yeah. Well, one thing I'm thank to God also our president, man of January is the Bible man. We are emphasizing in the January. That kind of the some things to us to create challenging and then to encouraging our Filipino teacher and student. Yeah, maybe relate to some our Christian school. So you may give some uh, idea and encouragement better for us to uh, push through and then for, for make way more the detaily and then to betterment in our, especially our Christian school network and then school minister. Thank you. Uh, there are several uh, associations of Christian schools in the country. Uh, there are several of them. Uh, but uh, I would like to speak uh, for in the ministry of uh, PCEC. We have a Christian Educators Network, SEDNET. And uh, this has been in existence for more than 20 years. But this year, there is a... Uh, re, uh, we relaunch it. Uh, so there's, uh, if you want to uh, connect with them, uh, their uh, main ministry is to minister to the teachers and to the principals of uh, Christian, Christian schools. Um, they do uh, conferences and fellowships in uh, different regions. I know there's uh, one that was held in Cavite, uh, in Metro Manila, they're going to do it around the country. And uh, if you would like, uh, after this, I could give you my number and also their contact numbers. Uh, Christian Educators Network. And it's very important that uh, uh, schools would have a network. Uh, secondly, I know some of you have uh, uh, Bible schools that are in your church or not uh, big, but big and small uh, schools. There are also organizations uh, like the Philippine Association of Bible and Theological Schools, the PABATS. Uh, so they hold annual meetings, uh, uh, um, quarterly meetings. Recently, I welcome PABATS. They have an office at PCEC now. And uh, we need to strengthen also our uh, relationship with the uh, Bible and theological schools. Uh, especially now, uh, unfortunately, uh, of course, uh, I don't know if there's uh, Korean Bible schools that are offering uh, honoris causa THD. And, uh, you know, they are ordaining bishops. They are uh, giving... Uh, uh, degree, uh, you know, uh, uh, diplomas, honorary degrees, a lot of them. So we, we want to regulate this because it's, uh, in, in Filipino, it's called dalawasinko. It's very cheap, you know. You just pay 5,000 pesos and you have PhD. <laughs> so we are strengthening relationship between the Bible and theological schools and uh, PCEC so that we you know, the standards of education uh, for our uh, pastors and Christian leaders, we need to see to it that they are given proper training. And uh, uh, we do not allow that. We do not recognize, you know, you, you pay for your diploma, 5,000, and you have PhD or uh, doctors of theology. So sad to say it's happening right now. So it's good to have uh, regulations. It's good to have coordination with Bible schools also. But that one thing is very, very much welcome, the theological ministerial training, whether formal, non-formal, and uh, we really appreciate uh, the helps and the ministry that you are doing to train uh, thousands of Filipino workers for the ministry.
And uh, Reverend Kim. Good morning. Yeah. Just a quick uh, answer to the challenge for your college. Mm -hmm. May every Christian school become missional, missionary sending mm. by encouraging your students before they get married or before they have a child to go overseas and work. Uh, so we hope that many Filipinos who are aged 22 to 35 will have a chance to go abroad and plant Jesus into the hospitals where they work, restaurants or hotels, or the sea ships that they will be working in. Um, we, we really want every Filipino Christian uh, to be at least a, have a sh three to five years exposure to becoming a missionary overseas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning. I am Songwon Kim. Do you know I'm youngest missionary in this place? Because if you met some Korean missionaries, you cannot be uh, under 48 because I'm almost the youngest missionary in the Philippines. Anyway, do you know the Korean missionary came here for only, almost 45 to 50 years? And then we already thinking about uh, exist trilogy in the Philippines, am I right? All foreign, foreign missionaries came to Korea for after Korean War, and then they stayed there around 20 to 30 years, and they gone, they dis disappeared in Korea. In the Philippines, we came here almost 90, 80 some age, and then until now, many Koreans came here. But as of now, so we cannot see new missionaries, the meaning is old age missionaries came here to the Philippines. The new is not come here to the Philippines. The meaning is you must, we must prepare for exit. But in Korean missionaries, I don't know how we can prepare ourselves. But how about you thinking about the exit, stra start, exit strategy in the Philippines, especially in Korean? Can I ask him to uh, Dr. David Lee about this comment? <laughs> <coughs> exit strategy. Better than the word exit, let's call it refocus into the 1040 window. We need to, the Philippine church, as well as the Korean church, needs to focus on the, in the Philippines we call it TUMB, T-H-U-M-B. Focus our mission efforts to send as many Christians to these five groups of people, tribals, Hindus, unreligious, Muslims, and Buddhists. If we don't focus on these five, after 100 years, Christians will still be 33% of the world's population. We are not increasing, we have not increased over the past 120 years. That's a sad statistic, but we need to be realistic and know that until we can win Muslims to Jesus, we will not change the scenario of the postmodern world that we face. And especially for the younger ones, I hope after you get some uh, more ideas on how we can become experts in doing frontier missions or underground evangelism. Uh, I personally believe in the next five years, we can finish the Great Commission. There is a great completion. PMA believes that it can be done, but it means more Christians have to go and make friends with Muslims. More Christians have to go and make friends with Buddhists, Thais, Burmese, Sri Lankans, 
more Christians have to become friends with Indians. If we don't do that, we are not going to change the uh, statistics of the world. And for the past four, 45 years, since Lausanne, 74, nothing has really changed the statistics of Christianity, only 33% of the world's population. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, because of the time, uh, we can have only one or additional two. Kim, Philip? Yes. Uh, this is Reverend Philip, uh, missionary Philip, uh, operating GMAN Philippine Broadcasting uh, here in the Philippines. So for Korean missionaries and uh, pastors worldwide. So I'm questioning Dr. Nono Batawi. Uh, I'm sure that final, our final mission target uh, here in the Philippines must be to train Filipino local missionaries and send them to the whole world in cooperation between PMA, PCC, and KMAP. Uh, we have to be focused on this mission work. Now is the proper time uh, to do this mission work. But, but I think uh, PMA one day seminar called uh, pre departure seminar uh, is not too enough to equip them as a missionary. Uh, as of now, uh, PMA pre departure seminar is just equipping the potential potential missionary. It means that their main work is the job, earning the money. And second work would be mission work. Actually, we need true long-term OFW missionaries as their main work. Uh, this is my question. Firstly, uh, how many uh, potential missionaries are you managing? Are you managing with the pre-departure seminar? Secondly, for sending long-term OFW missionaries, what plan do PCC and PMA have? And how uh, would you train them and sending them including job training? Lastly, uh, and for our cooperation, cooperation between KMAP and PCEC, PMA, what would you ask K KMAP for? to equip OFW as a true long-time missionaries. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Yeah, the pre-departure seminar is simply to, to equip OFWs to assist those that are, you know, like uh, how to protect themselves from abuses, uh, just being familiar with the laws, and you know the rights of OFW so it's not really a missionary training uh, it's more of a platform for you to be able to connect with other OFWs and be able to share the gospel so it's like an addition additional thing that can be given but like Dr. Lima saying uh, we need to really train them uh, in sharing the gospel and in multiplying disciples and uh, uh, more, of course handling small groups um, what we have seen in our former OFWs that were there, uh, they are not that effective because they are doing traditional uh, missions work. So what's tradition? You know, you go to, for example, if you're in Dubai, you share the gospel, you start a Bible study group. For the last 10 years, the same Bible study group. That's traditional way of doing ministry. But if we want to really see multiplication, we need to make sure, uh, even if we just disciple two or three people, that's why we just advocate for company three. Just get two plus you, three people, and then you disciple them, and then encourage them to start their own group. Each one of them will start again another group, and then next, start another group. So there is what we call 4G paradigm, four generations. When our signal in our internet is 2G, 3G, very slow. We want 4G. In Korea now, 5G, right? Yeah. So we, we want our churches to grow. We want success in missions work. 
4G paradigm. Meaning, if I, if I do ministry, I need to make sure that if I disciple my first generation, he will be able to share the gospel and handle a small group or a Bible study group. And of course, discipleship is taking place there. But I need to make sure that as I do that, he will begin his first generation, which is my second generation. And I will make sure that as he disciples his first generation, which is my second, his disciple will also be able to disciple another person. My third generation, his second generation. And I will make sure I will focus until the fourth generation. I will make sure that my disciples are discipling up to the fourth generation. His job is to do the same, down fourth, which is my fifth. So everybody goes and, uh, and, and, and disciple and really monitor up to the fourth generation. According to a study, if you reach the fourth generation, it will be unstoppable. So again, if we send workers and missionaries, let's not do the traditional way. Let's do um, uh, multiplication. Uh, let's do movements. So disciple making movements <laughs> where we see multiplication of disciples. Like uh, the one in, uh, in the campus, for example, we were, I was saying earlier, in uh, just four years in, in the university, he had more, han more than 400 students disciple starting from him. Four generations discipleship. And eight student churches started in one campus. This is modern way, or not modern way, this is the best way to do student and campus ministry. Because we have a lot of campus ministry, they have been there for the last 10, 15 years, but only very few small groups. So we have to do things differently. So if there is one thing we need to change, the way we strategize. So now we focus on small groups and we focus on movements. That's why PMA, we have to rewrite our uh, mission vision so that it will really focus on uh, creating movements. And again, whether you send them to China as English teachers, send them as engineers or professionals in the Middle East or wherever, then they can multiply disciples. And again, the equipping, you know, the, with, with the strategy, any religious background, this will work. So they can actually begin discipling even those from Muslim backgrounds, from the Tam, the Tam, that's easy, no? Uh, tribal Hindus and religious Muslims and Buddhists. Okay, if, if we want to succeed, that's the best way to do it. If we still send missionaries using traditional approach, it's still okay, but it will not really multiply. So let's go for something that will multiply, something that will really yield, uh, you know, a great harvest. Um, we are doing Bless Japan. Bless Japan is, uh, is in partnership with the Filipino Ministerial Fellowship in Japan, and we're mobilizing churches now in the Philippines to reach out uh, to the Japanese people here and to respond to the challenge in Japan. In Japan today, there are 20, 220,000 Filipinos 70% are married to Japanese. So, uh, but the good thing is, uh, Filipino wives are coming to Christ through our missionaries. That's their strategy. So that through the Filipino wives, they win the Japanese husbands. Japan is known for y y Yakuza, right? Y y Yakuza. But our, our missionaries, lady missionaries, their strategy, Yakuza. Yakuza. They win the Filipino wives, and through the Filipino wives, the Japanese husband will yuku, yuku sa asawa, yukusa. They bow to their wives. Yukusa, yuku, no? You, you, in Tagalog, those who know yuku, you bow. So the Japanese husbands, they come to Christ through the Filipino wives. And, but this is the greatest challenge. Um, the, the, the Japanese people is aging. In Pakna, there are only 10,000 Japanese pastors. 9,000 of these 10,000 pastors are above 50 years old. Only 1,000 pastors in Japan are below 50 years old. That's why they need pastors eventually. We need to train young pastors. Uh, now there are 1.9, uh, uh, no, yeah, all, almost 2 million caregivers in, in Japan. And their projection now is by 2025, they will still need 550,000 caregivers. So during breakfast, I was t telling Brother Kim, um, how can we respond to the challenge? Because the only need is they, they speak Japanese. Can we, in partnership, come up with 
uh, Japanese schools so that we can uh, prepare, uh, you know, caregivers that we can send to Japan. Uh, and if that is the case, we need to train them to do company tree. Maybe company tree, but he and only the, the <laughs> uh, you know, the old uh, folks that uh, he, he, he or she is caring. But uh, these are challenges uh, that lies ahead of us. And so we, we, let's see how we can respond and let's do disciple-making movement uh, as uh, simple as company tree so that we'll be able to multiply disciples. So I, I hope I have responded to the question. Yeah, today is really kind of a historical. We just initiate uh, kind of a, the cooperation ship today. I think uh, the key word of today is the collaboration and cooperation uh, as a partner for the, for the kingdom. So uh, I already mentioned about, I suggested actually the, the kind of uh, the following up, making up and following up. You know, I always experience about the, you know, the event, but uh, after event and nothing. So for me, the making up, following up is more important than any kind of uh, events itself. So I do want to just suggest and then uh, um, yeah, kind of uh, keep on you know, touching and you know, the, some kind of a building relationship for the future. So why don't we just to make some small committee or whatsoever, you know, the, some representative just gather together regularly and some more just to detail you know, for the future. We're talking about, you know, a lot of different kind of a job, but uh, this is pretty challengeable. But uh, for us, you know, the, we have a even kind of a common task. You know, I think almost the same goal we have. So why don't we just get it together as a partner, just to working forward step by step and one by one, something like that. So what about the, in public? We already mentioned about this. In public, can you just do, what about the response about this kind of a suggestion for, for all of us, please? Thank you very much for having us. This has been a uh, very fruitful and productive uh, consultation meeting. And uh, I look forward to, as I've said, uh, a greater uh, cooperation and uh, coordination and stronger partnership in the ministry. Thank you for more than uh, 45 years of partnership in the discipleship of the nation. Thank you for sending missionaries and uh, you are welcome in the Philippines, and we're looking forward, as, as uh, you have suggested, Dr. Cho. It, uh, I agree that uh, in order for us to have a, um, a better relationship and uh, greater cooperation and stronger partnership, uh, that uh, a, a regular consultation like this would be held. I agree that uh, uh, we should form a small group maybe uh, four or five people. Uh, you know, the, the top officers of PCEC, KMAP, PMA, and uh, Dr. David Lim uh, being the oldest one in the group. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we should sit down uh, regularly together and think of uh, new ways, how we can improve our relationship. And then probably once a year, gather all the uh, top leaders of PCEC and PMA and uh, came up for an annual conference similar to this so that uh, we can encourage one another and uh, we can update one another on what's happening and then dream together and learn together from each other. Again, maraming salamat po. Kang Samida.
Yeah, like what Bishop said, I, I, I am really excited about, you know, that gathering where we can come together and we can bring all the missions agencies also that are part of PMA so that we can network and, and really collaborate. And because we believe that as we work together, we can accomplish more for God's glory. So together, let's make the Great Commission a great completion in the Philippines and beyond. Well, I hope at the, after this conference, each one of you can commit to become a member of a group that is composed of Filipino pastors. I work every day under a Korean missionary, Dr. Huang Tae Yun. Huang Tae Yun. He is my board chairman, and I am his CEO. <laughs> he was missionary in the Philippines for 27 years, and was supposed to retire in Korea as the training director of GMS, Global Mission Society, the largest Korean mission agency. Huh? Of uh, Haptong. <laughs> now, when he came back, you know, uh, he was there, uh, but and I, every year when he trains new Korean missionaries, he would invite one Filipino to go to lecture to the missionary trainees of GMS. And in 2013, when I saw him that he was in Korea, I told him, come back to Manila. We will evangelize Asia together. After three years, no contact. He just called me January 3, 2013, and told me, David, I'm here. What do you want me to do? All my uh, staff, my workers in ASDEX, that school, do not know him. Only I know him. But within one year, all my Filipino co-workers told me, he is okay. He can become our board member and board chairman. Filipinos are very easy to work with. They are friendly and they want to be partners. And so partnership working together is very easy with Filipinos. And I hope in the years to come, starting today, we can, uh, and you can learn it by starting to add one more fellowship which is wherever you are working, try to invite one Filipino, but more important, invite yourself to a Filipino pastor's group, and then together, hopefully, you can dream things together. And I'm sure if you can do that in the next five years, uh, great things God will do through that partnership. Thank you. Thank you.